はい。Good afternoon. It is Tuesday, and this is the subcommittee of the Conservation Commission. And we have an agenda today where we're going to have a guest speaker, um, Carol Hepburn, and we're going to talk about dog issues. Um, and if we have time, we're going to talk about hunting on conservation land and two other topics, but we may not get there today. So, without any ado, unless somebody else has something to say, we'll bring in Carol. And Bruce, I want to know what you do to make your hair grow. I just eat good Sorry. food and think good. Sorry, job. that's off topic. <laughs> I had an accident in the woods. Nice to see that. It's my grandfather's genetics. If nothing else, it provides a cushion. Right. Hello, Carol. Yeah, I don't know. If, can you hear me? We can yes. hear you. Just can't see you. Well, I have no idea how to do that. Well, let's see if we can turn your camera on. Are you on a laptop? No, I'm at work. <laughs> One of the cops, one of the cops tried to show me how to do this stuff, but uh, at least that says four two three up there. But that's all I can see. And there's a button down here that says video. I I click that, but I don't. I'm not seeing anything. You should see something that says um, yeah video and the sign of a camera. <laughs> camera. I'm going to uh, turn you over to Aaron or somebody else. Uh. And I'm going to quickly go run the wash to a dryer while they fix this. Well, and then we'll. I'm sorry. We'll... What am I, what exactly am I fixing? I mean, I'm not going to be able to enable her camera for her. Um... No, but you can walk her through it maybe. Why don't we just go with audio so we have time? Yeah. Good idea. You don't need to see my face. Everybody knows what I look like. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, while Alex is gone, um, I'll just state that you know, we've, the commission has been working for, um, well, two years prior to the subcommittee being formed, trying to draft land use regulations. And then in the last two years, we formed the land management subcommittee. And one of the topics has been dogs. And so uh, I know Alex has primed you and, and um, discussed a little bit with you sort of what our um, uh concerns have been we got some feedback from a town survey that there was a lot of concerns about off-leash dogs on conservation areas so this has prompted us to consider um how we address this and, and talking to you i think gives us a little more information about how to do that yeah so first of all i when i sent an email to carol this morning i know i copied aaron and i can't remember whether i copied bruce and michelle did i Okay, so I I gave um, <clears throat> I gave Carol a heads up on what we're going to talk about, and I gave her several attachments. One was the data that we got from the town clerk on license sales and a graph, and uh, Michelle Michelle knows what that's all about, and <clears throat> I sent her our draft dog rules. And I also sent her the rules for the dog park. And I told her that uh, she could expect us to talk about dog registration and what the data says, and then uh, talk about dog interactions with people that we have issues with. And, uh, and I brought up record keeping and would it be possible to cre um, keep records of Things she gets involved in, so that so that we would have a, an idea of the magnitude. So, in that order, if we could just go along and maybe bring up the graph, maybe Carol didn't look at it, but Carol, you and um, so I could share a screen. No, <laughs> I, I I printed it out, Alex. I'm okay. looking right now. Okay, so in FY twenty. Uh, maybe Bruce is the only one who hasn't seen that. There was a sharp decline 
in license registrations. And then it leveled out. And um, so I asked Carol if we could talk about, does that mean that we have fewer dogs in town? And people, no, I, no. Or, or does it mean that people are failing to register their dogs? So I'll turn that over to Carol. Well, first of all, the chart that I'm looking at, um, if I want to step back a second and tell you guys, uh, when I first started it, what, in 2001, um, it wasn't until probably 2004, and I'm looking at charts here because I have to send all this to the town anyway, um, but I think around 2000 and uh, uh maybe nine or something, I started working in conjunction with uh, Sandra Burgess at the time at the, at the town clerk's office. Part of my mission statement was that I was going to try to help um, get the dogs registered. Um, and I did. I went out and I, and I, they would give me a delinquent list of people that you know, that I could go over. And I spent many hours on it. And I finally, I would make a lot of phone calls and do things that I, you know, that I normally is not included in my job, but I did. And I did, if you notice in 2019, um, that was one of our bigger years, I believe, of, of the charts of 1,500 dogs. Um, now, when it dropped in 20 and 21, you guys have to remember, and even in 22, those were the COVID years. And so town halls closed. Uh, you know, we, we discussed that we were not going to go after people. Um, and that's when I just continued trying to assist with the dog uh, registrations after that. And so now it looks like they pretty much stayed steady around 1,000, 1,200, 1,300. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's still even if those 15, uh, that 1502 number and 19 is, uh, you're looking at that. Remember, that's, you can add probably another three to 400 dogs onto that that were never registered. And um, the, the meetings that I go to, um, people are quite impressed that Amherst has that percentage of, you know, that low of a percentage of people that don't register their dogs, because most towns, they're, they're even way, way lower than that. Um, I don't know what the reasons are for it, but that's exactly what it happened. So if you're concerned about those three low numbers in the eights and the sevens and the nines, it started to pick back up in 2023. And I think people were coming out of the pandemic and um, and realizing, you know, those two years they didn't have to register their dogs that much. People did. Those numbers reflect mail-in ballots. I mean, mail-in registrations. Like when you get your uh, consensus in the back of that, you can fill out your um, your uh, dog uh, licenses on that and mail it. Uh, so we were able to get some, but to actually go to people's houses or you know, which I did. I went to many homes and registered their dogs right off my truck. Thanks, uh, Carol. And I still have that. I can still have that option to do. Uh, and But I only do it now when I, you know, somebody bites somebody or somebody gets loose and I pick the dog up. I make sure it's registered and has its rabies shots before I return it. So right. that's how Carol, I, I went. I went down to Wentworth Farm the other day. I happened to be in Amherst Woods. And there was a gal unloading her dog. So I pulled into the parking lot and um, sauntered her way. And she was uh, exercising her dog right by the entrance, right by the signs. And I don't think she planned to go any further. And she had a plot hound mix, looks just like a plot hound. No collar, no leash. And I didn't say much because I wanted more information than obedience to the law to the rule and uh i asked her if she had problems with other dogs she said never and i said do you walk down here often she says yeah i live down the street and i said is your dog registered she says i think so the caller's at home but it's my sister's dog 
So all of a sudden it wasn't her dog. Um, <laughs> and, but if she evidently intended to walk her dog without a leash, without a collar. And um, there has been talk on this committee and by others that a lot of people are um, walking their dog without a leash, either on them and not on the dog or not at all. So I have no idea whether what registering the dog has to do with our dog issues, except that Michelle had an idea that we have some sort of a form that somebody would check off saying that they have read the rules, one of which is dogs must be on a leash with a couple of exceptions. So there's the tie. If we were to adopt that, um, that form, um to to have people sign that they have read the rules then it's important to have dogs registered and it's important to have dogs registered anyway but for this committee that's and i ask myself okay why are we talking about dog registration that is one of the links and so if we could turn the conversation and just sort of accept the fact that there's a lot of dogs out there I think on the phone you told me you could probably identify 25 off the top of your head. And how do we go about increasing registration? You kind of talked about that, Michelle. Yeah, just about, thanks, Alex. Like back to the idea about having a checkbox that says, I understand Embers has a leash law and dogs must be on leash except for you know time, place. That was also addressing something that Dave Zomek said, which is, he his experience and maybe yours too carol is that people often say oh i didn't know that they they needed to be on leash and so it would sort of create this they're they're they are now culpable for their behaviors and they can't use that excuse and just to like a, one more you know way to get out the information that there's an expectation of having your dog on leash when, when and where you're supposed to so that's just a little more background on that idea so, Carol, if you could talk to us, you to, you've already talked to us about how you went about um, um, increasing dog registrations. And we know from talking to the town clerk that there are only required to keep a list of dog owners for one year. And I don't know if that's a year from the time the person signs up or if it's from one fiscal year to the other. I think if it's the latter and uh, we still have a list available um, of of people that might be delinquent. So could you talk to us about administrative solutions for increasing registration? Well, that might be one one key because I would always go up oh, you know every two or three weeks, like if the cutoff was in July, uh, that you would get your late fees, then that gave me some uh, teeth to talk to people in, in, in a nice way and tell them, look, it, I'm just calling to remind you that, you know, after July 1st, you're going to pay an extra $30. But, you know, either I can come and register them or you should go to the town hall and register them. But how I got those, that's the problem. I, I don't have those anymore. I I don't have a list of, of the... Um, I. I personally have a list, I believe, that goes back about five years of all the dogs that were registered at the time because I they send them to me on my phone. So if I'm out in the road, I can scroll down through the tags or the streets and try to figure out where the hell that dog lives. And uh, I have those, but if I... I also have a, a whole bunch of other years gone by that I keep in there just... But I don't keep mine much more than five years either because I figure a lot of them dogs are either dead by now or they've moved out of town or whatever. So, uh, you know, but I don't have any actual way of knowing whether that um, they even have the dog or not. And I think Sandra and I ran into that a lot because there was a lot of phone calls that I made that were pretty uncomfortable because, well, my dog died a year ago. Why are you calling me? And stuff like that. And that was an issue that I had um, that, uh, you know, was kind of uncomfortable for me. But I talked myself out of it like I usually do. But 
but those are the issues that we run into. So how how you solve it, I, I haven't got a clue, really. Honest to God, I don't. I mean, it's up to the town clerk uh, to be able to, uh, you know, go if they only ha if they're only allowed by the state to hold one year. I don't know how they can even help. Sandra always, she always had me at least one or two years yeah, of the delinquent dogs. Uh, you know that. Well, what well, we call them delinquent that were registered the year before, but hadn't registered back yet. Okay, so Carol, we good. Hold on just a second. We got two hands up for questions, and I was just going to correct this at one point. Uh, the the state is the the town is required to keep a list of dog owners for one year. They're not disallowed for keeping it longer. Uh, there's a difference there. Okay. So, Michelle and Bruce, and Bruce have questions. I don't know who went first. Bruce? Bruce. Uh, very quickly, what percentage of both the registered and the failure to register are students who have dogs? Uh, Bruce, I could not hear you, and I can't turn this up anymore. What percentage of the registered and unregistered are students who have dogs who come and go pretty, you know, every year? Well, you have to understand, Bruce, too, that there is another hidden issue behind all of this, and I tell people this. There's a lot of those students that bring their dogs in here, and, um, you know, I'll say they as long as they're registered, if they come from Framingham or I'm just throwing a name out there from another town, if th the law says you have to be registered in the state of Massachusetts. Now, whether you register in Amherst, if you're registered in Amherst and you move to South Hadley, you, you should go to the town clerk's office and, and make them aware of that, but you don't have to re-register your dog in that town for that year because it's already registered. Okay, Michelle. Thanks. Um, I just want to be, so we're talking about dog registration here, but I just want to make sure that we have time to talk about some of the other issues that we wanted to ask of Carol. Like we, we Carol, we wanted um, to know about like maybe unreported dog incidents and how they're handled. We're going to get there, Michelle. Okay, I just don't want to spend too much time on registration because that's not really our purview and it wasn't really part of our mission for this discussion for leash laws on conservation land. I think I tried to make a connection heading now with that, that comment. So if we could um, just wrap up, Carol, uh, we're, we're halfway through our call. <clears throat> um, how could you be helpful, do you think, in increasing registrations? Well, I think I just tried to explain that to you, Alex. I, I don't think I can be of much help. That's going to land in the town clerk's office and how they want me to help them. It's okay. not a part of okay. my job. I did okay. this as a courtesy. I, you know, I'm not, I'm an animal welfare or control officer, whatever you want to call me. Uh, most towns, dog officers, they don't get involved in this at all. That's up to the town and the town clerk's office and how they want to handle that. But I volunteered to do it okay. because I thought it was important and it was a good thing for my mission statements. So okay. I did it. But you won't find too many people doing what I did. And I, and now that I'm not doing it, um, I would assume that probably, you know, people are not, you know, are not so anxious and not so afraid to, you know, they're, they're going to be a little lax about registering their dogs. Uh, but, you know, if, we, if you can get, Anywhere between twelve and and thirteen hundred dogs a year registered in any town, you're doing a hell of a job. I wouldn't I wouldn't put so much emphasis on on that. I don't believe that that has a correlation with, as Michelle said, with you know dog bites or or uh, you know animal complaints or anything that we have to deal with. It does have a correlation if we if Dave decides to adopt the um, form that people have to acknowledge that they've read the dog rules and well that's fine but who who's going to enforce that now alex and where are you uh, going to we're going to go we're going to change subjects now carol we'll get to that all right so um i mentioned that uh, uh, there's been a lot of conflicts that we've we've heard about michelle has experienced 
I've experienced it where unwelcome contact with dogs um, can cause some to stop using a particular conservation area. And um, we're interested in um, uh, your comments on uh, how, how often you get a call and what happens to that information. If it's not recorded, we'd like to, to talk about, could we have a system uh, if it doesn't already exist, where no, um, uh, your involvement gets recorded and where the incident took place, so on and so forth. And I'm sure others will, will join in to redefine what we're talking about here. But first I'll ask you, Carol, you're, you and I have talked offline about this in prep for this call. Okay, well, as far as the as far as the dog uh, bites or um, any incidents that happen uh, in the conservation areas, or even should we say the dog park? Now, um, I do have every year I have to fill out this public safety thing here. This my thing. I'm looking at many years of of you know how many dogs uh, that I dog bites that occurred, how many dogs were put in my shelter. So I do have a very good record of all of all of that. My concern is, as we talked, Alec, that, that my concern and my biggest concern has always been the the people who don't report these to me. I if I don't if I don't get the report, if if someone walks in there and some certain dogs attack another dog or even a person, and we use the old age uh, thing about, you know, with car accidents, which is so stupid to even use that as an analogy. But, you know, so many people won't report it to their insurance companies because they don't want their insurance to go up. Well, that's so, sort of a, a fine line mentality with these people. They don't want to report it because they don't want anything. They don't want the conservation shut down. They don't want the dog park closed. So don't report it to Carol. Don't report it to the police. We'll handle it. Just, just do just what what you can do is uh, just exchange information out there, and then we'll pay all your vet bills. Just give me your vet bill, and we'll pay it, and all of that stuff. Now, Alex, as we discussed, there are certain incidents that are minor, and yeah, I get it. But here's my problem with doing this, with them doing that. Um, going back to the car thing, you're not, you know, you can fix your car. But these dogs that are vicious should not be out there. That's my concern. You know, I, I need to know. I mean, maybe I won't, uh, you know, throw them in jail or give them a fine or whatever I do. But at least they should be, I should be aware of it because now that dog has already attacked somebody and I don't know who the hell it is. And now, it's, do you think it's not going to go back out there and do the same thing again? Probably. So those are my concerns. Would um, what is your? Do you ever spend any time on the conservation property, or your calls busy enough that you don't have the freedom to do them? I do. Um, I have to abide by, of course, uh, the conservation rules that you guys put out there. They're different than my town bylaws, so my hands are kind of tied a little bit because your rules are, are very vague and so on some occasions. And, and um, you know, it, it's tough for me. You know how many conservation areas and so I do my very best on my other calls in between my other calls to try to go to these conservation areas. Like I try to go to Amethyst Brook at least two or three times a week, say around 11 o'clock, because I know after 10, they have to be back on a leash. So I go there. Now, years ago, I could walk in there a little bit further than I can now or had the time. But now I'm leaving my truck and I'm walking. And if I get something really bad, now I'm in trouble. So they don't really want me walking in there. Uh, and I'm only one person, as you guys all know. Uh, so it's difficult to, to, to deal with that. Yeah, so you, I see Michelle's got her hand up, but I want to acknowledge that um, you have some mobility issues. Yeah, right now, as you know, guys, I'm, 
in a couple of days, I'm going to be 81. And uh, I do have two replaced knees and two major surgeries on my back. And so it does limit me to what I can, what I did, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, but it doesn't limit me from doing my job. It's just that I can't, I I can't be walking in there. I mean, we've had a lot of incidents in Amethyst Brook, where, you know, where a horse got up in there and I, I dealt with that. And, and I, I walked for about an hour up in there until I found that horse. And I could do all of that. Uh, could I still do it today if I had to? Of course I could. You know, that's just me. But, but I don't, even if I could do it, Alex, as we discussed, I'm only one person. I can't, I can't be in all these conservation areas. And once they find out that I'm patrolling a certain area, then they go to another one. So... We'll get to it in just a second, Michelle, but just on top of what Carol just said, one of the times I called her, she was very nice, and but she told me that it wasn't a good time to talk because she was trying to figure out how to finally capture the deer that has been running around town with a broken leg, mm -hmm. which had maggots and uh, uh, infection, and she was going, she was working hard to try and capture it so it could be euthanized. So there's a lot of things that Carol gets involved in. She's the wildlife control officer, not just the dog control officer. So thank you, Carol, for everything you do. Michelle? Yeah, I was gonna say the same, Carol. Thank you for what you do. And oh, I'm gonna encourage the town to have give you an assistant or something because you do a lot and it's amazing. Um, uh, so one thing I heard you say is that some of our rules are not always clear. And one thing we've talked about is having better posting of the rules at the head of the conservation lands. And we're also uh, rewriting those rules more clearly right now. Um, and one idea that we've had that could help you with the other parts that you said where people aren't reporting some of the more minor incidents or things that would help you know if there's like a problem repeat offender dog out there is is including of your phone number or some kind of um, report form like QR code at the head of a trail so that th that information is readily available to people using the trail. So if they go back, they can see the phone number, they can report it very quickly using the QR code. And I just wanted to hear if, if that would be helpful to you, if you had any comments or ideas about that. No, that would be great, Rochelle. And I'm not... I, I think that would be a, a wonderful idea that if they if they had my phone number um, that they could call to me directly as they're coming out. That would that's got to be a huge big help. But again, we're relying on people to do that. And will will we get some? Of course we will. And it's certainly worth a try, Michelle. I would do it. I I mean you're you're always going to get people that are not going to do it. We know that. That's just the way of the world now. But but there is a lot of good people out there and they're and even if it's not their dog if they see it you know if they've witnessed another incident out there and they can then i can bring them in here and interview them and and get their version of what it is and maybe they can describe the people to me or the dogs to me and then i can go have something to work on so do it yeah my, my, my concern michelle is that the signs that you put up, as you know, Brad and I, over the years, we've tried everything possible. We Actually, Amethyst Brook has a sign up in a tree now, uh, about a mile up. And, you know, unfortunately, it's widely used by Pelham and Shootsbury. And, you know, a lot of those incidents aren't residents of Amherst, as you guys all know. Uh, so, uh, so the one lady the other day, I... I said uh, she's walking out, and 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 I always wait at the at the entrance there to talk to them. I figure I educate as many people as I can that way, and I tell her, and she goes, "Oh, well, there's no sign here." And I said, "Yes, there is, ma'am." I said, "It's right there," and I pointed up. And she's really snotty. <laughs> she said, "Well, what what the hell do you think I do? I walk around with my head up in the air like that to read something?" And uh, and so, but before that, Brad and I had put up. I don't know how many things they've either sawed them down, dug them up, took them totally away. It's a, it's like a battle with these signs. So I don't know how you're going to um, handle that part of it, but uh, I'm surprised they haven't taken the ones down at the dog park yet, but <laughs> I guess there's enough people there that'll watch them. 
Yeah, maybe we could put on like a fake camera or something next to the side. <laughs> we'll probably that camera, that that's another idea, Michelle. Brad and I talked about that. I brought it up to Brad. I said, Brad, why can't we just have a trail camera out here? But I don't know if that has something to do with, you know, the HIPAA rule, you know, the, you know, the, then we run into, maybe run into issues. But, you know, like a lot of these conservation areas in Northampton, they have that they put it out once in a while. It's really kind of cool to see the wildlife in there. So why can't we have something like that 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 we could look at? Uh, legally, how much could we get off of that if something bad happened? I don't know. But at least it's worth a try. Yeah. And sorry, just one more thing. I heard Carol say like something we hadn't talked about, which was in this like report incidents, it could be, you know, also if you see an incident report it. So maybe when we're considering that sign to, to include that for people instead of just if you experience the, in, in the incident, like. Yeah, so definitely put that in there. If you're observing a, um, you know, I don't know how you can word it, but you, you guys, you know, I'm not, I'm not great at that. I can barely run this goddamn computer. Uh, so, um, but you guys can word it to that sense that, yes, I want to know, even if you've observed something that you find disturbing out there, that should be reported to me, too, because I may may be able to do something with it. Or if they take pictures, everybody has a cell phone. With yep, everybody has a picture. Take pictures of incidents. Take pictures. Uh, you know, if you're observing a dog fight, uh, take a picture. I mean, my God, you're right, Alex. I mean, <laughs> you got to be careful today. Everybody's got. You know, the first thing you do is whip out their cell phones. That's why I'm careful when I approach people out there, too, because I never know, you know, who's taping me. Not that I give a goddamn anyway, but. So Bruce has got his hand up, but I just Carol want to say, first. Carol, you want to get to back to record keeping. And um, so we can I have an idea where the hotspots are. <clears throat> Bruce. Aaron, Aaron was first. Yeah, I'm having trouble also hearing you. Aaron was first. Aaron. Um, I have kind of a two-part question for Carol. Um, one was, are you getting reports from people of incidents where you don't have enough information and details on what has occurred or identifying sort of who was responsible um, that make it difficult to do enforcement? And then the second part is, have you had incidents with dog walkers, uh, commercial dog walkers on conservation lands? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, that is the first, the second part of that with a commercial dog walkers, not even commercial dog walkers, dog walkers that are, as, as Michelle can attest to, and I'm not going into that case at all, it's not anybody's business, but the bottom line is I have run into a lot of that, and uh, it is, it is an issue. We handle it the best way we can. Um, uh, but when you see a truck a car drive up and six dogs pile out of it, and uh, there are none of them are on a leash, they're just all running around, half of them in the road, half of them this way, that way, running all over everywhere, um, that should not happen. Uh, that can't happen. Uh, so, but again, you know, it, it's a fine line for things and I over the years have always handled things uh, I've always tried to mediate with people more than than everybody's yelling at me for fining them and doing all this stuff but over the years I've found out that fines uh do they work yeah they do at some for some things but other things it's best if we can just kind of mediate it and talk it out and uh try to figure so that's my approach on that and that first part of that question was um the, yes, the dog, like, for instance, there was a, a bite at the dog park. This woman had come down from Orange, and she got bit really bad in her hand, and it was a mess. Uh, but apparently, the uh, only description I got was it was uh, some kind of a yellow dog. I've got a report here. I could, I, it's, I, I, I haven't looked at that in a while, so I can't remember totally what I wrote in there, but I could never find that dog that bit her. Um, and I know she had surgery on that hand, too. So, yeah, those incidents happen. Um, thank God they're few and far between. Um, you know, I, as far as my dog bites, 
um, go, they average anywhere, the ones that are reported and I actually do an incident report on or a CAD on or anything that uh, of interest that I have to keep track of, I don't think I've ever had more than like, uh, never had more than 20 in one year of dog bites in either conservation and now in the dog park, like I said, I've only had one or two, which is, you know, phenomenal, really. I think uh, they've got new people in there, friends of the dog park running that now, and it seems to be running a little bit more smoothly now than it did before. So hopefully that'll work out because that's a, that's a great place for a lot of people. Okay, we got two questions. And first I wanna say, Aaron, when you put up your yellow hand, the background is your yellow shade. So I'm sorry that it's not apparent to me. That's better. <laughs> um, and I, I, I wanna cut these two questions a little close so that we can talk about record keeping before one o'clock. And if we need to go over, that's okay. Um, Aaron. I was just gonna ask a quick follow-up, um, Carol. Have have you seen a lot of incidents with children um, having interactions with dogs or children being in, uh, injured by dogs? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, um, I've had a few. Um, again, I would say, you know, probably 10% of my dog bites involve uh, children on uh Certain, you know, uh, children up to, uh, I'll say up to 16. Beyond that, I consider them adults anyway. So, uh, but younger kids, yes, I I do. Um, um, I When I first started a year, a few years back, I used to do dog safety uh, classes in schools, but now they frown upon that. So I don't do that anymore uh, to try to educate the young kids, at least how to approach a dog and and things like that. But uh, as you know, most people will just say, you know, when a child wants to walk up and pet a dog or something, you know, it's like, oh, my dog is friendly. It's never bit anybody. You know, you know you've heard that all your life and I've heard it in all my years too. So those are the issues that you have to deal with. It bothers me a great deal that for young kids, their face is often within reach of a dog's mouth. And a dog may, somebody may say, oh, my dog's friendly, but you never know. And a dog bite in the face can mar a child for life. Yeah, unfortunately, you're right, Alex. And that's uh, that's the sad part about this job, as you know, as you guys all know. Um, I don't see too many good things. I always end up seeing the, the worst in people, the worst in, in bites, the worst of everything. Um, so hoarding cases, so forth. So... Yeah. The, those are hard watches. The hardest watches, of course, as a young uh, child. And that's my concern out in the conservation areas, too, is that, like, you know, people are walking with their kids and they're running. They're all excited. Now the damn dog's off leash and it's running toward them and, you know, things like that. And when I get a dog bite that's that's bit somebody, I, my own my concern is, and I always tell them, look at that could be a child. You got you got bit in your uh, your arm or your you know your your leg or something, but a child is going to be way down there and they're going to get it in their face or you know. And I try I, that's my concern. Mine too. Okay, so if we could talk in in now. Um, about record keeping and you you have to file an annual report which means you probably write things up um as they happen and then and then synthesize it for the report um the 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 commission doesn't have i uh, access to that data until it's an annual report and so we don't have any idea where things are happening we don't know if certain areas are hotter than others. Um, we don't know if we had to spend money on some prevention like new signs, where, where are the priority areas and all that. Is there a way that we could cr create your database so that Erin could have access to it um, on a regular basis if she wanted to? Or is all your stuff on paper? Is any of it computerized? No, most of it, most of it, 
as you know, with the police department, it's kind of difficult when there's lawyers involved and, you know, there's bit massive dog bites. What happens is that I make up the incident report and um, and then um, the people will come in and ask for the report. Now, we have to give them certain re unless it's a court case. We only release that to a lawyer, um, the actual cases. But the case the cases are all on file here at the police station and you have to request all of that. That's HIPAA. Uh, so I can't, I don't know of any other, I mean, I'm not the person to be talking to about that because I don't understand all of it. It's just, except that, you know, I have all my major dog bites and incident reports. I've kept I, the major ones. So when I do retire, someone else can read them and, and look through them and see my court cases and, you know, animal hoarding cases and things like that. I have them in a file in my file here, but they're all on paper. Uh, they're not in anywhere. The only incident, the only dog bites that people would be able to get and ask to come in here for would be, um, you know, through the records department. As far as I'm no, again, I don't want to be saying something that I'm not totally sure of. Okay. Do do. Um, Bruce has got a hand, his hand up, and Aaron did too, and I don't know who went first. Uh, Carol, how many court cases have there been during your time? How many what cases? Court cases. Um, I believe I've had uh, only, in all my years, I've only had, I think, four or five in all my years. You know, like I said, we try to settle those out. We try to work them out, and uh, I've only been actually it was I was a when the old uh, town meeting or the whatever you guys had there that uh, the select board I guess it was called then I was only before them twice, and one of them was involved John Masanti's kid. Um, but other than that, we kind of settle them out, and uh, and I don't go. I've never been before the um, the, uh, the town council. I've been in court. Uh, I've never actually been in front of a, well, I was. I was in a couple of animal cruelty uh, cases, which were kind of bogus, but the, another person filed that, and I had to go testify on that one. Uh, and the actual, the other two or three that I've actually been involved in with uh, problem dogs and, and uh, you know, involved in euthanasia and all that stuff, it was before the, the clerk of court. That's what I needed. Thank you. Aaron. So um, I know that with HIPAA, um, there are restrictions for, you know, releasing specific information related to people. But if there was a way for us to get just the statistical data, um, I think that that would tell us what we need to know. So, for example, like the number of reported incidents, number of reported bites, that happen on conservation lands and like which conservation lands they happen on something that's like broken down into more of a, a statistical system that way it's not tied to anybody's individual identity it's more just uh um data record keeping um i feel like something like that would be really valuable to us because if we know for example 90 percent of the incidents are happening on uh you know Thursday mornings at Amethyst Brook when the, you know, off walk, off leash dog walking is taking place, then we know there's something wrong here, right? Um, or if it's happening like at Podic or something where there there's nothing posted at all, we, we can try to address the issues where they're happening with signage. Um, so just a thought if we could do it more on a statistics basis rather than incident basis. Well, what I can do for you, Aaron, um, I can't promise you exactly when I can get it done, but I'll work on it. Is whatever times I have here, I'll I'll try to get you something, and I will email it to you. I'll go through all my incident reports. Uh, it'll take a, a bit here, but I will gather up what I can uh, about the conservation areas. Um, I do have a list of, like I said. Um, like from 13, from physical 13, there was 11 dog bites. 14, there was 13. 16, there was 14. 17, there was 16. I do have all of those. I just got to go through them now 
and and those because they'll all be incident reports or CADs and I can read and I that will tell me where they were. I'm sorry, but I can't remember in 2013, uh, you know, where those 11 dog bites took place. But I will I could I can get it to you. I just have to do it from my own personal records and I'd be happy to do it for you. That would be great. And, um, you know, I, while you're doing it, it would be helpful to know if anything's happening at recreation areas as well, because I can share that information with our recreation department. Um, I know we're embarking on some signage and some rules and regulations that would span both conservation areas and recreation areas. And so having some information about what's happening at rec areas, I think could also really inform the town about you know, what we need yeah. to do to be well, responsible. Well, yeah, like, you know, Groff Park and, and those places there. And, and also, I, are you, do you guys cover like school grounds or anything like that? Because well, that was a major dog bite with those kids over there at Crocker Farm a while back with those kids in the swings when they were out for recess and they both got mauled really bad by that pit bull. So, um, you know, I think that's the rec. I think the rec department handles the, that. Handles that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. but it, that kind of information we I can pass along to the rec department. Okay. Um, because I think there's the same limitations in terms of not knowing what's happening. Um, yeah. With conservation, as there is with recreation. Yeah, that's true. So recreation areas could include the school playgrounds during recess, or like Groff Park, or or Kendrick Park up here, or parks like exactly. that. Right. Yep. Exactly. Yep. All right. I'll see what I can do for you. Following up on that, if we were to put a form or a QR code at the entrance to um, um, to conservation area or within the conservation area, you are going to get an increase in the number of communications that you get. So it it might we'll be talking about much more than dog bites. We'll be talking about other kinds of misbehaviors, dogs off leash. Could could we perhaps uh, assist you in setting up something like an Excel spreadsheet where you could uh, just easily go in and record uh, incidences? Uh, we could make up some codes so you don't have to type in the conservation area all the time and make it easy for you. And um, maybe in the long run, that would solve uh, or provide what Aaron's looking for. Yeah, I'll work with anybody on anything as long as somebody's going to assist me in uh, in showing me how to do it. <laughs> I'm ha I'm happy to. If this group is we we're pretty small, it, it it's just you know you're <laughs> we're a small group, um, but we're um, working on this issue and. I didn't, what I didn't send to you is a memo um, that we have, we have the rules, which I did send to you. And oh, by the way, I would love to receive your comments on those rules for dog park and, uh, and also the conservation land. If you think they're vague, tell us. And, okay, uh, I, I, uh, you know, the conservation, I'd have to go back over that. I don't think I got those, but I did get the dog park rules. And that you want to remember, uh, for three years, I was on that committee. So yeah. I, uh, you know, I, I couldn't, didn't have a voice, but I mean, I didn't have a vote, but I certainly had a voice. And um, I, I did um, suggest an awful lot of those uh, rules that are on there on the dog park. I there there may be at some point the the i read somewhere where the friends of the dog park are considering maybe uh changing some of those rules but i don't know for sure i wasn't able to attend their meeting they had down there the other day uh so um Aaron, do you know who who's basically. on the friends of dog park yeah the friends of the dog parks they've got a new uh, uh leader i can't i don't can't remember her name right off the top of my head yeah uh, i don't on. That's on an old um, landfill. I'm not sure that's conservation land, but it's not. It, it, yeah, the dog park is definitely not our jurisdiction. Okay. Well then, okay. Well then, I guess we don't have to worry too much about that. Then that somebody else is going to have to deal with that one. Uh, but you know, like I said, for knock on wood, thank God. Uh, considering all the horror stories we've heard over the years about other dog parks and other towns, 
ours is um, so far, you know, other than a, a few incidents, uh, which is to be expected. Uh, I think the major concern now is that dogs are leaving. Some dogs have left there and gotten sick. And I think that that's that that's an issue with all dog parks. I mean, you know, uh, and in defense of people, uh, you guys that own dogs, you know, I mean, your dog could look perfectly healthy, such as you could be. I could be walking around with COVID right now. I don't know uh, unless I test myself. So that's a problem with dog parks. And they do come out of there with a lot of uh, uh, t uh, t uh, ticks and fleas and you know, my concern would be Geradia and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. I just, I worry about things like that in dog parks because they don't, if you don't pick up your, your, uh, your feces quick enough, you know, things like that. And dogs walk in it and then they take it home and their, and their paws. There's a lot of things that we study on that, uh, of the behaviors of dog parks throughout the country. Uh, so it, it is what it is. It's a, Michelle. Yeah, Carol, I'm just wondering about your like perspective on like dog ownership and use of the conservation lands for dogs, because you, you mentioned other towns use it a lot. Do you think it's been changing over the years? It's been pretty consistent sin since you started. Is like off-leash dogs and the number of dogs increasing or staying the same? Just wondering what your long view of it has been. I think, I think, um, Michelle, I think uh, someone asked me that the other day, too. They asked me a question, do, since the dog park has been up, do you see a decrease in, in uh, visitations to the conservation areas? And I have to answer, honestly, no, I don't. I, I see a lot of people using the dog park, mostly old people with small dogs and things like that, which is great. I go there once a week and talk to them. There, this is a group of people that go there, the old people, and they sit there and talk about everything under the sun. And they got these little rug mock dogs, and they have a great time. But <laughs> I, I've been down there late <laughs> while we've been dealing with dogs. I make yeah, it so, to stop by the dog park fairly frequently, and uh, I have seen a lot of. Um, golden retriever size, Labrador retriever size dogs. Um, and they do get very excited when they're there. When they get there, they just run till they can't run anymore. And, um, and they, and the, and the owners come there regularly. I ask them, do you use the conservation land? And a lot of them say, no, I just come here. Yeah, you'll find out that oh, the people that are going to use that park and getting back to Michelle there, I think the reason why there's so many people and um, uh, that enjoy taking their dogs for walks and run and letting them run and they can't do that in a dog park. So they're going to go out in those conservation areas. It's just simpler and quicker uh, for them to go in, out there for an hour and let their dogs run around and be free uh, than actually contained into a dog park so though you're always going to get them i i don't think there's any more michelle though i don't think it's increased as much uh it hasn't decreased but i don't think there's quite so many uh, uh my big problem is most of those people that i encounter and not i shouldn't say most but probably a quarter of those people i encounter down there they don't even live in amherst you know, mm -hmm. they, they live in Pelham, they live in Belchertown, they live in, I don't know where the hell they come from, but they're coming from all over to go in Amethyst Brook. And uh, for some reason, that, that's that been a big thing. And now Wentworth also, too, uh, has always, but Wentworth is, how I tell is because I empty the waste stations once a week. So I can tell if they're highly used. The, the ones that have, have really decreased is like, um, uh, um, uh, the mill district, uh, the mill uh, place down there, mill mill lane. They that one behind uh, uh, that's by the waterfall there that gets highly used, and the puffers pond still gets used highly. But there's a couple of them that don't. Wentworth has been used pretty strong too. Yeah. Uh, they're still using these conservation areas, guys. You, the, it did. Carol, it, should we? Just throwing out an idea, should we close conservation land 
to people who are not residents of Amherst. Oh boy, can you do that legally? We could require people to get a sticker in order to run to walk their dogs. Excuse me. Buy a sticker just like you have when you go to the landfill. Yeah. Or the recycling center. You need a sticker. And that keeps people from out of town coming in to use it. It also helps pay for it. Hold on. I think that that would be a very legally challenging. Very challenging. It's a good idea, guys. We've had millions of ideas like that over the years, and they all they all look they all sound good out of your mouth, and they look good on paper. But to enforce them is the issue. Enforcement is a big, big thing in 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 our line in my line of work is enforcement. Well, if somebody had a sticker on their car and they go to the landfill and they're dumping their stuff, the guys walk up and say, stop, you can't be here. And there's no enforcement. They don't, they can't be there. If you were to go to a parking lot and see dogs coming out of a car that doesn't have an inspector, just like an inspection sticker, you could say the same thing. Yeah, I suppose. But again, you're looking at resources that we don't have who's going to enforce all of it? who's going to stand down there for hours and catch every car and look at every sticker i well, think it's a we have we hold on good there. idea guys and you can certainly we have talk. we have talked about forming a citizen group to look after conservation land and trails in particular excellent if, if we formed that group um i don't think they would have a uniform but they could and I don't know if they would be deputized in any uh, in, with any enforcement authority, but they would be eyes, and they could uh, they could perhaps help in watching uh, th what happens. No, that's a great idea. They don't have to have an enforcement, and they shouldn't be confronted. You shouldn't be confronting people in there. I mean, I know of two or three occasions where I thought to myself, "Oh well." I'm old, I don't really care what they do to me, but some of them get very confrontive and you don't want to, you don't want them involved in that, uh, that shouting match, you know, you got to learn how to de-escalate de a lot of things. You can't, you can't, you can't lose your temper. Uh, you know, I do occasionally, I'm human, but uh, I try not to. Uh, but if they would walk out there, if there was a group that it's like the Friends of the Dog Park, they're overseeing the the running of the dog park, which your group could oversee the conservation areas. And if they see something they don't like or whatever, they, again, all they got to do is call me, you know, and I can either come there or, or talk to them on the phone. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, I like this idea now more about trying to get volunteers just like sort of steward of the conservation area and they can not just be regulatory or but also trail um trail issues or maintenance or just basic cleanup but um i was also wondering back to resources carol if the town has ever given you an assistant or has that ever been floated or is it would it be hard to find like a part-time person to help you with the basic patrolling of of things like conservation well you might you might be able at some point to figure out to somebody that might be able to, uh, you know, uh, work on the weekends or something. Um, you know, I work 24 seven, as you all know. Uh, but you know, that's my choice. I, I enjoy my job. I, I, as long as I'm physically and mentally able to do it, I'm going to continue. Um, uh, but, um, but I, I don't know. This town is funny about that, and we have to justify why we're hiring somebody. So if we could put somebody in there at something, get somebody to hire, just actually even to assist in all of the, would the conservation area uh, department, would they be willing to fund a little bit of money for somebody to patrol those areas? That would be a great big help. Uh, for the for for certainly for me because that technically is not part of my job description as you know um, I assist but uh, you know expecting me to walk through conservation areas twenty four seven 
all day, you know, 365 days a year is just not feasible. Yeah, we haven't talked about that, Carol. And just a point of fact, I don't think any of us have read your job description. So we'll, we we just take it for what it is and the fact that you're a generous person and, and we appreciate you spending time with us now. Uh, yeah. Bruce? Yeah, anytime I can be of help that has to do with animals, as you all know, I I probably uh, care more about animals than I do people. Uh, so I, anything I can do to help the animals, wildlife or otherwise, I, it doesn't matter what. As long as it's an animal, I'm going to always try to help uh, wanna, as long I wanna, as I can. I want to come back to that before we leave. Bruce? We should check in with Dave about the existing trails volunteers. Are there any? My understanding from his, there are. Okay. Uh, Carol, um, with regard to your job description, I don't want you to read it, but we've been talking to you about an interest, uh, an interest, an issue that we've been working on. And you have all kinds of things to do. You are not the dog warden. You are the wildlife control officer. You're dealing with skunks under people's porches, um, raccoons in their garages, uh, deer with broken legs, all kinds of things, bears in people's chicken coops. How much of the kinds of things we've been talking about uh, occupies your time? Um, actually, not as much as you might think. Uh... Um, my my time is consumed a lot of it, believe it or not, on the phone, trying to put out fires on the phone. You know, I got a bird that's in my yard now. It's got a broken leg. Well, what do you want me to do about it? Things like that, you know. So a lot of those questions and a lot of people are trying to surrender their animals now. And, you know, those type of things can be handled over the phone. So I don't have to go physically to so many calls. Um, the other question, before I lose my train of thought, because I'm old, I, I wonder, I've always thought about this, but I don't want to throw this out there to too many people, but I mentioned it to, uh, Crest came in here one day and wanted to talk to me about my job and different things and if they could be any assistance. And I told them a few things that they could do. Like, you know, during the summer when the dogs are swimming in the ponds, if somebody could patrol that area over there at Puffer's Pond. There's a lot of things that Crest could actually do if they wanted to do it. But I don't know. Again, I'm not going down that road. But uh, but I thought about it. And I thought, well, you know, if you're trying to get me help, there's a whole bunch of Crest people sitting over there. I don't know what in the hell they're doing, but maybe they could help. Well, um, working with you, we will will improve our list of suggestions because the kinds um, we deal with the policy level. It's it's Aaron and Dave Zomack that deal with the administrative end of things. So we have the rules, which I did send to you, our general rules for dogs on conservation land. There were three attachments, um, and. There's also a memo uh, to Dave from the Conservation Commission, which hasn't been finalized, it's in draft, which he just commented on this morning. But it's a whole list of what can we do about it. And, and maybe we should, in, in a call like this or offline, and I'm happy to do it offline, but get some better ideas on, on how we can administratively do things that would have promise rather than just throwing a dart at the board and hoping it sticks. Um, yeah, that's true. I, I agree with you. Now, I do have, I just pulled it up while I was talking to you. The only rules I have are the Puffer's Pond rules and regulations. That's I do have that. But that's it, different from the rest of it, right? No, I didn't send you anything specific to Puffer's Pond. It, it starts at the top with dogs. Oh, okay. Well, the, first okay. One, the first one says that commercial use of well, walking dogs on conservation land is not yeah. allowed. Well, Alex, I don't, I don't have that. 
could I just say something really quickly? Um, so Carol was referencing that she had rules, old rules from Puffer's Pond. So Carol, at the at the front end of this, when I had mentioned that we've been working on overall land policy, one of the um, key parts of that has been finalizing sort of rules and regulations overall for conservation land, not just pertaining to dogs. So we're hoping that by the end of the year, we'll have those finalized and that would apply. They'd be very broad across all conservation lands. So hopefully that'll help with enforcement. Yeah, that's true. That, that'd be great because like I said, now we've got, you know, like I said, you've got separate rules and regulations. I don't know when, when this was actually put out. 2016, I think it says it on the data of this paper, but it gives all the rules and regulations of what you can do at Puffer's Pond. But that's that's not Amethyst Brook, and that's not Wetworth, and you know all those other places. I don't think I've ever seen that. Um, if Aaron has a copy, I'd like to see it. The committee'd like to see it. And um, a Carol, copy, if you have, if a you copy have a, of the Puffer's regs. Yeah. Yeah, Puffer. So, it's called Puffer's Pond Rules and Regs. Yeah, so if you just go on to, uh, Town of Amherst website, there's like five different pages with rules and regulations, which is kind of why this committee was originally formed was because there was all of these uh, multiple iterations of regulations and some specific to different parcels. And so this this whole effort was to consolidate. But yeah, there a lot of them are old and outdated and not currently relevant. Yeah, I would, I'm glancing down at it through here now. I don't, I mean, this is pretty cut and dried what I'm reading. I mean, it's, that probably doesn't need too much tweaking on this rules for Puffer's Pond. I mean, they're, you know. What did you say the date was on that, Carol? I don't know. In the bottom of my page, when I must have printed it out or something, was 7 6 2016. Um, so Carol, I'm looking if you at go my... on amherstma.gov, uh, it says 1320 Puffer's Ponds Rules and Regs down the bottom. Okay, I can, I can uh, track here, it down from Carol, that. I'm looking at the email that I sent you this morning at 644. The first attachment is dog registration in Amherst. That's the one with the data and the graph. The next one is dog policy rules for conservation review, revised 820. That's the that's our current statement for dogs on all conservation land that was attached to your email. The okay. next one was rules for, for dog park. So there were three attachments. If I'll you have could... to look at that. I didn't, I, I printed out, I thought I printed everything that you sent me, but I guess I, I, I'm probably didn't do that. Um, I have, let's see what you, you sent me dog registrations in Amherst. Uh, that was a dog re registration. You sent that one, and I did print that out. And then you sent me uh, something else here. Dog rules for commission. Uh, okay, right. I see it. I see it. I just did not print that out. I'm so sorry. It's on my phone now. I'm looking at it on my phone. Yeah, I can read that. So on your computer, um, you know how to use track changes? How do I what? Yeah, okay. You answered the question. Um, I'd be ha I would invite your comments on those rules that you're looking at, the dog policy rules for commission review. If you think our rules are not specific enough to be helpful, uh, tell us. I invite you to tell us where to tighten them up. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then the other one is dog park, but that's I just included that. Uh, I couldn't remember whether that's commission land or not. So any um, any other questions? Yes, we, Michelle's got her hand up. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I, was I was just thinking um, we could hear from Carol, you know, an hour later about what the basic pieces of information that you collect are when you get like an incident report so that we can put that on our signage or just relay that, like um, whatever you would ask them um, in most basic form. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Aaron, I couldn't, I didn't understand that. What is it? So when 
like we were talking about posting a sign at the trailheads or something. If you see an incident or if you have an incident, call this number or use this QR code and report it. Like what are the key pieces of information that you'd want from somebody when they report it? Oh, um, what information? Well, I mean, I don't know if you want to, I suppose you could put something in there, but I wouldn't know what. I mean, okay. you're going to call me. I mean, you know, the calling part is crucial, of course. And then because um, once they call me, they're going to be able to describe to me what they saw. Uh, so, I mean, I don't think they have to be reminded of that uh, per se, but maybe, I, I don't know. Okay. okay. So if I could just throw out some ideas here to kind of narrow this down. So like I would think name, phone number, property, and then like a brief description of what the issue is. Yes. And then, and then Carol's number would be provided on the form um, in case they want to call her or when she receives it, she could call them. Yes, absolutely. That, that, I, that I would like to be informed of anything that they consider that could be endangering, um, you know, uh, people or other dogs, you know, I mean, there's a lot of dog fights too. So not only pe people getting bit, but dogs are getting mauled by fighting amongst themselves. And then most of the dog bites, are, as you know, occur when people are trying to break up their dogs from fighting. So, uh, you know, that, those are issues that are very important. Yes. So if we, let me ask a technical question, not to you, Carol, but to others. If there was a QR code at the head of the trail or other places along the trail that somebody could, you know, use their phone to connect with, does that QR code or could that QR code go to a form um, so that somebody could fill it out right then and there? Yes. And automatically get sent to Carol and Aaron. I think all that's possible. Well, that would that would create the record that um, I think we're looking for, and would create access to the data for uh, Aaron as well as Carol, and we'd make sure it was in a form that Carol can use for putting together her annual report, so it's as useful as possible. <clears throat> and then make sure that 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 form that the QR code goes to um, names the location adequately and provides opportunity for somebody to load a picture or two. So is that, you're telling me that's all possible? Yeah, I've never create, created a QR code for, so I don't know, I, oh, my understanding was it just gets you to a website. So we can explore that later. I was actually was thinking about using QR QR codes on gravestones, on a whole nother project. But so anything else? I think this is a great place to end. Carol is just very generous to join us, and I'm sorry you. It didn't work out last week, Carol. But you went to your annual training for um, people in your line of work, and um, you stay up to date and. You're a heck of a resource, and I, uh, you went down the list of things you're not doing anymore, and I had to chuckle when you told me that you won't, you're not crawling under people's porches to pull out a skunk. <laughs> uh, but I do, I do remember you telling me about when a skunk got into, I think it was the high school, and how you went in there and cornered it and picked it up by the tail and carried it out. So you have been a courageous person in the interest of wildlife. And um, and I believe you when you say you care more about the wildlife than you do the people, because you certainly are good at what you do. So, well, thank you for all of that, Alex. And can I add one more thing to that? Uh, I don't know if it was Aaron who asked me this question, but or you did. Uh, you know, I think if you could figure out some way of this, thing you're putting there to have people notify me if if they see anything or anything you know people are more apt to do this if it can be if they can remain anonymous sometimes you know that's the problem you know like i'll get a lot of reports um that do me no good to go to court with when they say you know this is an anonymous uh you know call unless i can actually bring them in here 
and and put them in the room and audio and videotape them. I can't bring the anonymous stuff, and I think Michelle, you know this. I can't bring that no. in to uh, as part of the yeah. case. The, 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 the guy, they're just going to be object, objecting every five minutes to that. So, if we could figure out a way to make people more comfortable about reporting this stuff to me, I don't know how you're going to do it, but it was just a thought. Yep. They're really big. Yeah, I I think we the 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 opportunity or the frequency of cases that go to court are low. You said that yourself. But the frequency of cases that uh, are bothersome is higher, much higher. Yeah. 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 Well, I think I think it's like those people at the dog park there with the incident I had with a woman that was abusing a dog in there, or allegedly abusing a dog, um, and they wanted me to press animal cruelty charges. That's another case where, you know, they have pictures. That's all they had. And when we brought them, or they came to the police station, when we interviewed them, again, they didn't. They wanted to remain anonymous. They would not testify. So if they won't go to court and testify what they saw, there's not much I can do about certain. I have to handle it in a different way, and I did handle that case in, in a somewhat different way. Maybe it wasn't the best, but knock on wood, we'll see how it all plays out. Anything else for Carol but in, in, as we wrap this up? And and I'd be interested to know from uh, the commissioners and Aaron, oh, uh, did this help? Did this help focus? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it very helpful. Absolutely. It's good. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much Carol. Carol. Really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you. Anytime, anytime, guys. You're all my heroes. Take care. You're my hero. Take care. <laughs> Keep up the good work. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Bye, Carol. Thank you very much. I need to depart. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Thanks for um, having her, Alex. That was a good idea. It was really yeah. helpful yeah, to hear was. from the the front happy, line happy to i think we got some nuggets that we can work with the form that you're talking about michelle did you yeah, not, yeah. Did, did michelle did you agree to try and come up with a first draft for that form are we talking about the like report incident report form or just the thing to put on the registration incident report form i didn't agree to that um i guess i could think about it but I think Aaron laid out some key I think items. It's, I think it's pretty simple. Okay. Um, I could even, I mean, yeah. Let me talk to you. I Dave need to go. I'm that. sorry. I'll hey, Aaron, I have to call you later. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, so, I got to go too. But um, sounds like, like Aaron can put that together. It's pretty easy to make a QR code, but the town probably wants some control over that. So it might be best done in house. Yeah, we have a communications manager who I think could Why don't we help with avoid that. stop? Why don't we not go there and get the form first and then go to the town about the QR code? Sure. Um, just one step at a time. And in terms of next commission meeting, um, uh, I'd like to present them with our mission statement, I think. Would that be okay if I send that to Aaron to put in the folder so that we have one more thing for the commission to look at? I think that's Sounds a pretty good, good shape. Maybe we could make a slide to share with just the mission statement and just have it up on the screen like in big font for everybody to just see i don't know that it's short enough yeah okay sounds good to me okay and um aaron do we have to when we do the agenda do we have to say what it is we're going to talk about like if we're going to talk about our mission statement or we're going to talk about the dog policy or we're going to talk about hunting do we have well, to put on the agenda of what the topic is? So I think it um, generally, like if we're going to be covering like whatever we talked about. Here we go. Round, Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. On the last round, I would, um, you know, just put land management subcommittee updates, um, unless there's going to be like some known extended conversation or input on a given topic, in which case I would probably 
you know, say specifically like dog issue discussion or something. Um, Well, they're leading to a vote, so they it is um, um, not the, it's more than discussion. It is uh, what would you what is it we're not supposed to do offline? Um, um, Deliberation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is deliberation about the issue, and we name like when we have a hearing. There's a lot of detail there about what the subject is for the hearing. And if the commission is going to be talking about something that it will vote on, does it have to be described in some detail so the public can be aware of it? Well, so we shouldn't be voting on the land use policy per se, I don't think during these like sort of informal updates, we should just be reviewing. No, 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 yeah, no misunderstand. Until... So the process that I, that I saw or that I, the process that I hope we're do, doing is that we send something to the commission, ask for their comments. Right. We, the subcommittee. Right. Then after we absorb the comments, give it back yep. to the commission for a vote. So we avoid voting on everything at the end. Well, we have to vote on everything at the end um, as a right. cohesive Fine. document. Fine. As yep. I can say. But... I'm trying to avoid a backlog of, of stuff come up at the end of the calendar year by clearing it through the commission piecemeal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, so if you're going to be voting on something formally, then I think it should be on the agenda that you're going to be voting on it, like commission to make a recommendation, commission recommendation on dog rules. And then if you're asking them to you know, make a vote finalizing those for the final document, then I think we should include that on the agenda. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm constantly wary of being behind on giving stuff to the commission for their comment. And uh, I'm not where I want to be now. They haven't gotten enough yet. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I got to find time in my own schedule. I've got, you know, four projects going all with time deadlines. Mm -hmm. I wish I was retired. <laughs> I would, uh, I really, <laughs> I took the weekend off and did some stuff um, that I need to do for me. But so I'll queue up the mission statement and I'll, um, um, and send that to you. Um, that okay. should, and I'll try and prepare a slide. Or, or yeah, you. I mean, if you just send me what is the content of the slide, I can create the slide just in our normal PowerPoint presentation. Okay. So that it's and not it, like a separate document. And we had said we were going to put some words in, um, like definitions. What does this mean? And Bruce did a lot of that for for the ag policy mm -hmm. and uh, the mission statement has words in it like protect which probably need to be defined and um, particularly as as we move forward so that everybody's clear on what the mission statement is because everything in the policy is guided by the mission statement yeah i mean i um yeah. <laughs> I mean, so like when we're drafting bylaws and things like that, things that are sort of just like a standard definition that one would ordinarily know the definition to, um, we wouldn't necessarily include a definition for. But um, I, I mean, maybe what we do is like in the last, towards the end, have a final list of definitions to share with the commission as like a final section. Um, but I wouldn't be too concerned with having definitions ready as we go through each section. I think that yeah, might be a little. As we're doing each section, that's a good time to figure out which words you want to define. I'm not going to be defining prepositions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're going to be key words that yeah. are guide what we do. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I'm writing for, or we're writing for the next generation or two of commissioners. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the mission statement is something we move by. Oh, yeah, everybody agrees with that. But now let me do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is what I'm trying to avoid. Yep. Okay. 
So you're going to brief Dave on on what happened here. I thought it was a great call. She's a good person to work with. Um, yeah. I have no idea. It's um, now that nobody else is on. Lots of people say <clears throat> that they're encouraging her to retire. She doesn't get that. There is, if you talk to Carol, there is nobody's, you can't tell her when to retire. Not you, but the town. And she gets a lot of assistance from the police department. They say, if you can't do something like get a skunk out of a trap, teach us how to do it. And the cops go and do it. Mm -hmm. So she's getting a lot of assistance. Mm -hmm. um, she has her sister, I think it's her sister, living with her. And um, I think she's the only salary. So that's important to her. And when she says she's going to keep doing it as long as she's able, she will. But she does spend a lot of time um, in the field. I know tracking down that deer with a broken leg that was just flopping all around. Apparently it had been in town for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And she managed to corral it. Mm -hmm. So she's she's... She's not idle. She's. So I think we got a lot of cooperation from her today. Some very good ideas. She's easy to work with. But yeah. to ask her to to manage a new database, uh, that's not going to work as well as that QR code idea that we were talking about, where somebody fills out the form using their phone, and it automatically goes to you and her. And that way you can get the information you've been asking for about where things are happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that's the biggest thing that came out of this call. Um, I don't know what to do about dog registration. If, 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 um, getting that information we just talked about is more important. Yeah, I mean, particularly if a lot of the people who are having incidents are outside of the town of Amherst or not Amherst residents, then, you know, our efforts trying to get people to register their dogs might be fruitless. Um, and so what about, <clears throat> there are incidences where people out of town can't do something. Um, they can't go to the recycling center, for example, unless you're in Pelham, um, I think. Can Pelham buy a sticker for the recycling center? I don't know. I buy one because I don't want to pay $700 for a commercial outfit to come by and pick up my trash. And that's what it costs. Mm -hmm. You see those big trucks roaming around? Yeah. If you want your trash picked up, it's $700. Yeah, I know. I used to live in Amherst. It was super fun. <laughs> I didn't have a truck. So um... So if we... If we um, It'd be interesting to talk to Dave about whether or not we could disallow people from out of town using their dog, uh, the conservation land to run their dogs. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's... People, people out of town didn't buy that land. Yeah, I think being a college town, it it's even more complicated and layered oh, yeah. because, you know, you I, have a I lot. Totally, I, totally spaced, I totally spaced. I totally spaced. You're yeah, absolutely it, right. I didn't even think about the students. Yeah, I think it would be. And, and then you get people walking from their property to a space. They're not going to need a ticket or a. Uh... I was thinking it just flashed on me when Carol said we got people coming from Belchertown. We got and she named a bunch of towns to walk their dogs. Right. And students weren't just weren't on that list. So I spaced out on that. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of nice conservation lands, and so, you know, it becomes a destination for people who live nearby to come. Um, I think I think we're going in the right direction with reporting, um, with, you know, maybe having something that people, you know, an acknowledgement when people do register their dogs, improving our signage. Uh, I think these will all be positives, you know, net positives to try to improve the situation and also, you know, help us to monitor what's going on a little more closely. Yeah, I think 
Michelle in particular, and me and Bruce, but we heard things from Carol that she gets things she gets phone calls about um, that we never see or hear. For example, I wasn't aware that somebody got mauled by a pit bull in Grove Park. Um, maybe you heard about it. No. So, um, I think you got a reason for a positive report to Dave. <clears throat> and um, uh, I don't quite know what to do with the next meeting of this committee, What whether we try and button up dogs and give it back to the <clears throat> commission to vote on. We've got a whole bunch of comments to go through. We're just going to consume an entire meeting. Do we really need to go through all of the comments? I mean, I feel like some of the comments, um, well, I don't know. I'll leave it. You, you It's really your call um, how in-depth you want to go. It's just that we're sort of at the, at the, you know, the final hour of getting them approved. And so, I mean, I know commissioners are trying to do their due diligence. I think enforcement is a big question. How are we going to do better enforcement? But I think that, uh, and I think the other question is, you know, for me, like if somebody is, is um, disabled and can't walk their dog and they need somebody to walk their dog, to me, that would be an exemption from the rule. Like um, if, if assistance is needed for handicap accessibility reasons, then that would be that an exception. That was Rachel's comment. Yeah. I mean, that's one thought. I don't know how big of an issue that is, but, um, but that wouldn't be like you're walking five dogs, right? It'd be a person walking one person's dog or it's, maybe it's, it's my, attitude. my attitude is it's not hard in the rules to provide for that. If you choose the right words. Right. So, yeah. So in terms of, do we need to address the comments? Um, uh, not so much the, the the comments that come in as a result of the newspaper article, but I'm not going to ignore comments that come in from the commissioners when we ask for them. Yeah, I'm not suggesting that we that we ignore them, but I think we could do some front end consideration to make it more streamlined so that it's not like we're, um, you know, spending a long period of time going over every single comment trying to come up with like maybe here's a potential solution to this problem. If we could think about that ahead of time, then that might be a good approach. Well, you know, commissioners can put their thoughts in the, in the document and they can put their own comments about, uh, I think Rachel gave us the best comments. She has been pretty consistent. Um, yeah. And a way to streamline that is for, commissioners to use track changes and put their comments in but we have trouble sharing that because of uh, uh operating in the sunshine rules so i can do what i have been doing which is taking on the workload of of taking the work off the other members of this committee and doing it myself and giving it to you and then have them review it <coughs> um and that frees up a lot of their time, but it commits my time. I'm doing essentially for the Conservation Commission, I'm doing twice what I signed up for. I've been on this committee almost the entire time I've been on the commission. So I'm my my duty is twice what a commissioner's duty is who's not on this commission. And um that's why I'm really anxious to be done by the end of September, end of December. So I yeah. hope I hope when you said we're nearing the end, you made me shudder. <laughs> well, for we the are. for the but policy, I hope we are. For the policy, I know there's some things that in in the charge that go beyond the policy, but I'm hoping for the policy itself that we're we're kind of coming to conclusion. Yeah, I'll have to go back and reread the charge. That's enough on that, I think. Thank you very much for your time. Is okay. everything okay at home? Yeah, I mean, I've got, um, we're, we're being recorded publicly, so. Uh, I, okay. Yeah, my son is sick. He's homesick today. Okay.
Just thought I'd ask. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. All right. You too, Alex. Bye-bye. Is there any member of the public on? No. Okay. So I don't think we're fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye.